welcome uh, to the 15th lecture of uh, webinar series of the Archaeological Sciences Center, IIT Gandhinagar. Uh, today, uh, we are having uh, with us uh, Professor K.V. Rajan, one of the renowned uh, archaeologists of uh, this country who has worked extensively in the peninsular part of uh, India. His expertise in the, is in the areas of early historic archaeology, epigraphy, and uh, particularly he has carried out uh, some important excavations at the sites of Kodumanal, Purundanal, Purundal, sorry, and also uh, extensively researched upon the early historic uh, uh, trade, early, early historic uh, 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 cultures of uh, South India. Uh, Professor Rajan started his uh, career uh, in the Th Tamil uh, University Tanjavur and later on he moved to uh, Central University Pondicherry uh, from where he carried out a lot of uh, uh, research. So he has also uh, ca carried out some important uh, uh, re researches into the megalithic cultures, understanding uh, the trade relations and also the local uh, craft activities in and around the site of uh, Kodumanal. So I uh, thank Professor Rajan for uh, sparing his uh, valuable time for uh, delivering this talk. And I also uh, welcome all the participants who have uh, uh, spared some time to attend this lecture. I request now Professor Rajan to uh, take over and deliver the uh, lecture. Thank you very much uh, for the nice uh, introduction. Uh, Professor Prabhakar. Uh, today I would like to deliver a lecture on early historic of South India. South India is one of the important uh, geographical zones where it has been three sides covered by the sea. Uh, due to these geographical factors, uh, the South India had a great maritime relation with uh, Sri Lanka, Southeast Asia and uh, uh, Western world. Uh, besides that, uh, our Indian inland trade. The South Indian historic trade, or uh, the early historic trade, what we popularly called, uh, that one has uh, survived uh, this trade, uh, or we are having evidence from the 3rd century BC extensive trade. But before that, uh, now the recent evidence that is are coming up in different parts of the world, uh, particularly Southeast Asian countries and also Sri Lanka and uh, West. We are having the trade relation around 5th century BCE. So these evidences are coming up of different uh, primary sources, the archaeological, epigraphical, numismatic, literary and other scientific data, clearly emphasizing that there was a trade that was exist even before 5th century BCE, but uh, clear evidences are coming up from the 5th century BC onwards. Uh, we are uh, looking forward of the future radiocarbon datings and AMS datings. Uh, with regarding to the uh, early historic period, uh, the major uh, source for uh, writing early historic period, particularly the early historic period, is that archaeological data that is coming up uh, very quite uh, uh, enormous data is coming up nowadays because the excavation is in progress uh, in Karnataka, Andhra Pradesh, Kerala, and Tamil Nadu. Uh, particularly in Tamil Nadu, uh, every year uh, we are excavating nearly seven sites, seven to ten sites by the Archaeological Survey of India, Tamil Nadu State Archaeology Department, Madras University, Tamil University, uh, and Pondicherry University also they are excavating. So in that way, there are a lot of data is coming up and it is uh, recalculate or uh, reassess our understanding of early historic period. With regard, regarding to literary data, the major data that are available in South India, the earliest literary data is that Sangam uh, literature. Uh, and in Andhra Pradesh, Satrasai is also available. But with regarding to epigraphical data, there are two set of epigraphical data for early historic period is available. One is that uh, what we call popularly called Brahmi inscription, that uh, Brahmi inscriptions are found in two languages. One is uh, what we call Prakrit and another one is Tamil. So the entire India, if you see that, except uh, the Tamil Nadu, the entire Indian almost subcontinent, we are having a Prakrit Brahmi. The language is Prakrit and the inscription is Brahmi during the early historic period. And in Sri Lanka also, the same Prakrit uh, inscriptions are available. 
but in the small region that is in the southernmost part of the uh, indian peninsula we are having a language only because that is called uh, tamil uh, language is used to write the brahmi inscription with re regarding the numismatic evidence also uh, we, uh, initially we thought of having only the roman coins but later on we started getting uh, the coins issued by the local uh, kings and chieftains uh, something like a charas and uh, pandyas and malayaman like these type of coins are available and uh, satavagana coins also available uh, in andhra pradesh and uh, say like foreign accounts we are having mostly from western side greek accounts but whereas the eastern side we are having a less number of foreign accounts uh, besides all these scientific data like a glass technology iron technology gemstone technology copper technology in all these scientific data also helping us to understand the early historic period in a more appropriate manner we are having a scientific data is helping to re assess our archaeological data the same way the archaeological data also helping to synchronize with the scientific data for instance river migration based on our settlement pattern we could able to reconstruct the river migration of ancient paleo channel and also based on our port and port cities and port towns on the coastal uh, tamil nadu we could able to reconstruct the ancient coast line uh, like that there are several data like even height in branches available from uh, sivakalai and adi channel and uh, several gemstone indices available from kodumanal and uh, the ancient agricultural activities that we have recollected from the based on the pythagoras so uh, all these uh, data uh, coming from different disciplines also helping to understand the scientific uh, data of the early historic period and uh, with uh, the tamil nadu is concerned uh, there are uh, for the past 30 years different agencies like agricultural survey of india tamil nadu state archaeology individual scholars and universities are working Uh, for the past 30 years and almost more than uh, 3000 archaeological sites have been already documented and uh, there are certain gaps are uh, available uh, because due to the area that is yet to be explored otherwise uh, from starting from uh, prehistoric times down to the colonial times we are having a continuous archaeological data in tamil nadu and uh, if you take a small region Uh, what we call kongu region uh, what popularly called the eastern part of chera country uh, it was associated with the chera country particularly with the kerala as the entire koyamuthu region if you take that koyamuthu region uh, data it is very clearly shows that uh, there are certain settlement pattern and also the concentration of archaeological life related to natural resources like gemstone or iron ore and some of the forest products so these type of settlement pattern uh, helps us to see that how it has evolved in the trade uh, if we, there are two type of uh, dimension to the trade one is the internal trade uh, that what we call po po local level trade uh, connected with through highways and trans territorial uh, trade that is for the material that are moving away from tamil nadu and going all the way to a northern part of uh, northern india and also the material like a carnelian bead agate and these are the material that has come from and we are having a gangetic uh, area also we are having material that has also come from uh, to the south like a panchmar kinds nbp northern black polished ware black slip ware all which clearly shows that there is a continuous contact between the north and the south in the case of external trade there are two type of uh, trade is we could see because of the peninsular india all the three sides are exposed to the sea so for the day uh, uh, even before early star period there would have been existed some trade contact uh, between sri lanka and also india like that we are having a westbound trade we are having evidences in up to egypt and oman and also the arabian peninsula region and socot island and if you get to the east bound and if you take it then we are having uh, evidence up to now philippines up to china we are having glass beads and also we are having vietnam nowadays and in uh, thailand and indonesia and sumatra we are getting uh, evidences of early historic times and uh, next if you see that what are the evidences that are emerged are unearthed in our archaeological exploration and excavation is that gemstone industry 
அயன் அண்ட் ஸ்டீல் இண்டஸ்ட்ரி காப்பர் இண்டஸ்ட்ரி கோல் இண்டஸ்ட்ரி டெக்ஸ்டைல் இண்டஸ்ட்ரி கிளாஸ் இண்டஸ்ட்ரி அண்ட் நேவிகேஷனல் இண்டஸ்ட்ரி ஹாஸ் பின் எக்ஸ்போஸ்ட் இன் அவர் ஆர்கியாலஜிக்கல் எக்ஸ்கவேஷன் so the limited excavation that has been conducted in the entire south india uh, these type of uh, industry activities we could uh, see in our archaeological excavations and besides there are natural products that are available uh, and uh, natural produce like a pepper uh, cardamom medicinal plants ivory also we are uh, getting in uh, Uh, in our excavation and, uh, and also in other parts of the country even in egypt we are getting some of the ivory object that has been exported from uh, south india and sea product like a salt industry and uh, shell industry and cons both are moved uh, from the coastal region to interior parts of the country and agricultural products like uh, what we collected from uh, uh, porundal excavation we collected a uh, paddy 2.5 kilo paddy intact Uh, from a four legged jar uh, kept in the chamber uh, it is a, a as a ritual practices they used to place this as a grave goods in the cist and also some other uh, grains also we collected from our excavation and if you take that uh, how the gemstone have been collected how it has been exported to different parts of the world is that the raw material has been from the nearby area and picking and grinding has been taken place and polishing and drilling is a final stage from where they have produced the excellent beads uh, particularly in and uh, around kangayam region of koyamuthur region and uh, the method of collection how they collected the raw material how they have identified the raw material how they brought from other parts of the region is that is clearly mentioned in the literature Uh, so for instance uh, for our hill arts that what they call kundram is embedded with the jones is mentioned uh, in the natrine in sangam literature same way the semi precious stone is uh, clearly mentioned how they have collected all this has been uh, mentioned in the literature from the literature we could able to see that which area uh, the literature is speaking and, and in that particular area when we explore we collect that uh, same gemstone this is a quartz mine uh, uh, near kangayam the place called arashampalayam now it is under the control of geological survey of india so this is one of the ancient mines of that period where we are getting nearby close to these all uh, gem uh, industries and also this type of raw material zone we are getting lot of archaeological sites and uh, are so available the top one is uh, the natural one the bottom one uh, we collected uh, from our archaeological excavation at kodumalar so the sisal mark uh, uh, which you have you could see the sisal marks uh, in the top left uh, image in that image you could see that the hardness of this uh, quartz is number 7 if you want to cut this piece and you require some type kind of a tool that could withstand the hardness that may be a steel they might have used and that are one of the in our excavation we exposed to one gemstone industry and embedded with a lot of barrel shaped quartz pieces and also on disc shaped pieces so these pieces have been collected and they have started Uh, you can see that uh, one disc shape uh, quartz species available and nearby anvil is there and there is a part shard uh, that part shard is having a inscribed this is a inscribed part shard a return uh, chamban sumanan was returned in that part shard and uh, thereby close by you are having a lot of uh, chips that may, that is involved in the manufacturing uh, center as a served as a manufacturing center and if, if are, from this uh, trench uh, the gemstone industry we collected large number of uh, barrel shaped uh, quartz pieces and also disc shaped pieces and also piece with a crystal and uh, close by we are having a rubbing stone that is uh, made of corundum so corundum how they prepared uh, these pieces and you can see the disc shaped quartz is available and uh, nearby they have made a drill one is uh, removed and another is above uh, yet to be removed and you could see that uh, on the uh, on the right side 
it has been a double edges have been used to cut this pieces and you can see the closer view of that one so they have prepared uh, rings as well as the beads out of these pots and uh, not only the pots they have used uh, this was the tail lot half left one is the corundum where they have used for rubbing or polishing the uh, rub rough ups and the uh, right one is that uh, partly finished and uh, and the bottom one is in green in color is the very the costliest uh, Uh, semi precious stone that are available in this region this is only available in india only in kangaim region and uh, this is all finished product of both quartz as well as carnelian carnelian that has been imported from north and also lapis lazuli that might have uh, imported from afghanistan region and it has all the shows that there is a trade contact between uh, the region of north and also south and uh, that the scanned electronic microscope study of double diamond drill you could see that perforation we could able to see that it shows that uh, the people have used double diamond drill probably the diamond is not available so they might have used corundum tip uh, for boring and also polishing and here this is a lapis lazuli pieces that uh, normally it is not available in south india so it all it has to come from afghanistan it was a long trade contact between either uh, uh, hand to hand or direct contact that we could not we know but uh, anyway the prakrit inscription clearly shows that there is a continuous uh, contact for longer period of time that's why we are getting a, a large number of prakrit names personal names in kodumanal and also in keeledi and other places uh, nearly more than uh, 1500 uh, brahmi inscribed portraits so far have been discovered in tamil nadu alone if you take the entire india the inscribed portraits will not cost even 100 small region uh, is uh, having this much of inscribed portrait that also shows one kind of literacy level and also the kind of trade contact with them uh, if you take it to sri lanka there are more than 1000 Uh, brahmi uh, prakrit brahmi inscriptions are available whereas in india if you take the ashokan time other, other than ashokan edict we are not getting much uh, prakrit uh, inscriptions so though the uh, sri lanka may be a small region but it is having more than 1000 uh, inscriptions uh, during the time of early historic period so the agate beads that also has to come from maharashtra region and also you are having a, a large number of carnelian chips and uh, it shows that the raw material has been imported to tamil nadu and they have uh, manufactured the carnelian beads locally so these are the from a single grade uh, we have collected uh, more than uh, 2200 carnelian beads and in, uh, in in some of the graves yielded uh, around 1000 some of the graves yielded 850 Uh, carnelian etched carnelian beads uh, this shows the economic prosperity and also economic wealth uh, they are having the capacity to purchase this much of uh, carnelian beads and uh, they, by knowing that it is one of the fastest uh, object in south india and it has been buried and it kept as a uh, grave goods in a uh, uh, iron age medals or in early historic megalithic monuments Uh, this indirectly it indicates their economic wealth and also the trade contact between north and south and in one of the uh, floor and we got a pot shirt uh, in the pot it the name is uh, clearly written as champan and sumanan and in another pot shirt we are having written as sumanan and champan here champan is a father and sumanan is a son and again another part we are having sumanan and champan there it is called father and son so three generation that means champan uh, is a grandfather and sumanan is a father again champan is a uh, the grandson so three generation uh, has lived here in this floor i is clearly mentioned through the uh, inscribed parts so and uh, besides that uh, close to this uh, gemstone industry we are having a jain beds in the jain uh, there they have uh, they have donated 
ஜெயின் பெட் அண்ட் தீஸ் ஜெயின்ஸ் பெட் இஸ் கிளியர்லி மென்ஷன்ஸ் ஒன் ஆஃப் த மணிய ஒன் நக்கன் த வாட் வி கால் ஜெம்ஸ்டோன் டெஸ்டர் ஆக்சுவலி கான்ட்ரிபியூட்டட் ஏ ஜெயின் பெட் ஏ டு ஏ ஜெயின் மார்க் நியர் ஈரோட் வர் த பிளேஸ் இஸ் கால் அரச்சரூ அண்ட் ஈவன் டுடே Uh, yes, we could see in the uh, Gulf of Kampi and the, very, the same uh, identical gemstone industry, even today the traditional artisans are, are still working on the gemstone and uh, uh, this is a place called Kangayam. There, there you are, uh, uh, present day gemstone industry is surviving. It shows that uh, even the technology is not uh, changed much except for small uh, electric motor and otherwise. The technology from the early historic period down to the till, till today, the same technology is being used in preparation of the gemstones. And uh, the other next one is the glass. So glass, uh, we could able to locate almost uh, 10 uh, bead making centers. Actually, Mortimer Wheeler has identified Arikamedu. and after that we are having several play like tirichana tirichanur near kadalu and we are porundal like that manikollai there are several places where we could able to glass making industries uh, and in sri lanka in our budavaya uh, underwater archaeological expedition and they brought to light uh, some of the glass ingots so and uh, these type of ingots also available in uh, uh, in our area near uh, kodumbalur near tiruchirappalli we uh, we found a lo- quite a large number of uh, 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 like uh, this glass industry so it clearly shows that glass has been uh, have been manufactured extensively and it has been exported to the different parts of the world particularly southeast asian countries and uh, there are uh, the chemical composition of these uh, uh, glass beads uh, particularly the analysis clearly shows that all soda beads but still aluminum uh, is the one part and it is aluminum 3 is manufactured in uttar pradesh area and aluminum 2 uh, in the western uh, coast and also there in the south uh, down south we are having aluminum one the number one is there kept so it clearly shows that movement of the glass beads in different parts of india and also uh, to the south asian countries uh, for instance from uh, the material moved from uttar pradesh uh, to thailand uh, where that uh, chemical composition of the thailand uh, glass beads and also the uttar pradesh are one and the, the same way uh, what we are getting in arikamedu and also in thailand uh, the chemical composition also the same and here that uh, what we call aluminum 3 uh, that also moved uh, towards eastern direction we are getting large number of uh, inscribed parts words and uh, carnelian beads and quartz beads and also the literature says that uh, the material came from uh, klang thom that means kalahath uh, akkam it is mentioned in a sangam literature the material came from klang thom so these all evidences clearly shows that the people are having a maritime trade uh, with the south asian countries during the early historic period and uh, from there it moved to thailand and from thailand it moved to okio from okio culture it moved to china now recently uh, there are evidences are coming up in philippines also so these glass uh, what popularly called indo pacific uh, monocrop beads are found uh, in the entire south asian countries uh, and uh, luckily in our excavation conducted uh, near palni hills uh, at the place called porundal there we could able to uh, locate one of the glass polishing furnace it is a, it's not a glass making but actually a glass uh, polishing uh, industry and uh, around that furnace we could uh, get large number of Uh, uh, small small bowls are available around this uh, furnace and you could see that these uh, bowls uh, looks like a kushan bowls and uh, these bowls are kept all around this uh, furnace you can see the see the white patches because of the heat and uh, the soil has turned into white and these are the bowls that all, within these bowls uh, we got large number of uh, beads uh, for instance more than 10000 uh, beads have been collected glass beads have both uh, uh, green uh, as well as uh, 
red beads have been collected uh, from there and uh, this is uh, from uh, 25 square meter uh, only 5 into 5 meter square uh, meter trench that one in that we have collected more than uh, uh, 10000 beads and uh, besides we are having two type of furnace have been exposed in the excavation one is iron making furnace that is uh, built on the surface and it is always the furnace is above the surface and another one is a crucible furnace Uh, that is found below the surface so the left one is a iron furnace the iron ore is put into the furnace iron is extracted from there and the right one is a crucible furnace the uh, the iron pieces are placed inside the crucible and they have added some flux material and the iron is converted into steel so this is a steel steel manufacturing uh, furnace and below that we are getting a crucible in vitrified condition and a lot of iron objects also collected both from habitation site settlements as well as from the graves so there are two type of uh, iron tools were available the one which we have collected from uh, graves are mostly uh, weapons or offensive type of tools like a sword and uh, other other type of uh, like a, a Uh, knives all of these type of materials we normally get it in the graves whereas in the habitat site we all type of agricultural tools uh, we used to collect from the uh, habitation sites so there is a lot of difference between the tools that are uh, being exposed in the burials and also the one exposed in the settlement and uh, for luckily uh, near metur where uh, we went today that uh, steel manufacturing center is there salem Uh, steel manufacturing center is there and uh, there uh, there have we collected more than thousands uh, of graves uh, this uh, site was well preserved because the because of the metro dam when the water level is uh, so high it all submerged in the during the month of may the water level goes down these all graves are in one of the grave we collected a, a sword the sword initially we thought that it is a iron sword but when our analysis clearly shows that uh, uh, it was a steel so we collected a sample from this uh, telangana site and uh, we have sent it for uh, extracted carbon from this sort and we sent it for dating and the date goes back to almost 1200 you can see the date of the telangana sort uh, goes back to this is from arizona university we have dated and it clearly shows that by around 1500 itself the people have started making uh, steel uh, converting iron into steel so it, it so earlier we thought that iron has been introduced in south india uh, from 1100 according to hallu then we thought that it kumarnakalli and the 1300 now bukashagar and other side clearly shows that it almost uh, in the gangetic valley as well as in south india the uh, uh, introduction of iron goes back to second millennium bc that is 2000 bc in the mangadu site also we have collected another object that also goes back to around 2000 bc so the entire india if you see the map and the entire the concentration of in midganga valley as well as in uh, karnataka andhra pradesh and tamil nadu all the manufacturing center if you take into account we can Uh, with our confident we can say that india has entered into the iron age around uh, second millennium uh, bc so the, besides that there are uh, copper uh, technology also copper ore is not available in uh, in tamil nadu it seems that ore has been imported and they manufacture copper objects here these are the copper furnaces you see that we could see the furnace uh, mouth is here and this is a furnace and the white patch is there once exposed we can see that there are a lot of furnaces there, there in uh, around there was a street here just uh, on the side of the street there was lot of uh, cottage industries like that every if i uh, 10 meter you are having one furnace 5 meter you are having another one furnace so these are uh, this is the furnace it has been connected here it is bellow has been fixed here so the air will pass through and it will come to the furnace to raise the temperature and uh, even we got crucible and close to these furnaces which is used for manufacturing uh, or uh, smelting copper objects 
and also the lot of copper objects also we collected from our excavation and uh, some of the copper objects are having high tin brands and these are the material that have been collected and you can see that perforated uh, also seal is there and uh, here also we have bowls are there and lot of motifs are available these have been collected from this area where the copper is being smelted and uh, besides that we are old also condition also we cut one uh, tiger figurine inlaid with uh, one uh, carnelian and no lapis lazuli so alternatively the lapis lazuli and carnelian both have been imported material and they have been used whether the uh, uh, tiger figure itself we have been imported from the other part we don't know but uh, the chemical analysis clearly says that it has a locally made and uh, these are high tin uh, bronze bowls were also available and recently in uh, sivagalai uh, uh, we also collected high tin bronze and uh, Dr. Shada Srinivasan is analyzing uh, the content of this uh, hydrogen branch. We hope that whether it is locally made or it has been imported from Thailand, that we will come to know in our uh, scientific analysis in the near future. And if you take, besides that, we are having a lot of spindle holes are available in our excavation, like in a key lady or Alagan Kulam or Kudu Manal or Karur, whatever that there are plenty of. Uh, Uh, spindle holes are available and likely we collected a, a cotton piece with a sewing pattern and this is in the in situ position initially we thought that this all uh, we reported as a, a bone tool and some of them were ivory so we were suspected that this may not be used for uh, hunting because ivory may not be used so then we were, uh, through our uh, uh, interaction with the textile industry we came to do know that it is used in the uh, uh, that industry for running the thread so that way they call it pow and besides there we collected a cell industry you can see the lot of cell in here and also nearby you are having a furnace these cells uh, analyzed by arthi deshpande from dakan college it has come from kurke region that means uh, gulf of mannar so it shows that the people are having contact with the uh, gulf of manna during that time and they have imported the material and also uh, close to that we are having one part is emerging that part is contained the name of uh, uh, the trader and uh, these are uh, not only from uh, uh, kodumanal or kiledi and also alagan kulam also uh, the huge uh, cell industry uh, uh, is exposed uh, in the two years back in our excavation so it clearly shows that uh, not only the site like a kodumalal there are several sites we are uh, met with a lot of uh, uh, sales uh, uh, kiledi and also karur and also kodumalal and all the sites which is having a trade center uh, normally exposed to this type of sale uh, industry and uh, of course i could not able to show one uh, uh, video even today uh, i have given a website Uh, but unfortunately due to the technical problem i could not show the video and uh, to even today the people uh, the traditional divers used to go dive in the sea and they collect the conchel uh, and uh, there are uh, site like uh, in the high hill region like a uh, kodaikanal panli uh, hills we are having a medicinal plant so this is a medicinal plant uh, what they call thandri maram and it is uh, it, that uh, stem bark uh, even seed everything leaf everything is a medicinal so that's why the people went there and they settled uh, there that's why we are having a huge uh, iron age site uh, in this place that called tandikudi the original name is tandrikudi which is mentioned in inscription the 13th century inscription mentioned this place as tandrikudi but today it is called tandikudi and close by we are having a pepper growing the same area pepper growing is a pepper is, is being produced and also cardamom uh, is also available in the so so all the cardamom pepper ivory medicinal plants and all help to uh, uh, increase the trade and uh, we came to know from inscription of a pandya king uh, he is emmandalam kundarliya kulashekara that is a kulashekara is the pandya king and which mentioned that there is a dispute between the manalu and also tandrikudi the both is mentioned here uh, so the king personally uh, made a visit to this place and settled the trade dispute 
between the two villages of Manalur and Kandripudi, both we have been identified with archaeological vestiges. And uh, besides, there are a lot of uh, Iron Age um, uh, megalithic monuments are available, and also early historic period also these monuments have been continued, like a dolmens or curved circles or cisburials. In one of the excavation at Purundal, uh, this is a transepted cyst, east facing transepted. In that, we got uh, two in this uh, uh, four legged jar, we got 2.5 kilo uh, paddy kept intact. And close by, we are having a ring stand, and the ring stand also having a name called Vaira. Around that ring stand, we got the Yechudu Carnelian beads kept as a ritual. And also, so you see that the name is written at the bottom with a Brahmi script. And around that, we are having a plenty of Carnelian beads. This uh, ring stand kept on the horse stirrup. You are having a so big sword. And these are the paddy that are collected from the four liquid jar close to this ring stand. And also some of the cereals also we have collected from the bowl. So it clearly shows that uh, this uh, paddy and these cereals have been dated. Uh, we have sent it for dating and we got the date of 490 BC and also date of 450 BC. Since that, uh, this uh, paddy uh, has given a date of 490 BC, we believed that uh, the inscribed portrait that kept close to this paddy also single time deposit. So that's why we have dated to the Brahmi script also 490 BC at that time. But now we are having uh, more than 40 dates. And uh, we are also having uh, 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 gold objects and uh, silver objects, gold beads. So it shows that gold has been extract extracted, either it has been imported from the Roman world or the Western world, or it has been extracted in the polar region of Karnataka. And uh, we are, uh, the Panchmar coins, uh, plenty of Panchmar coins are available in Alakan Kulam and uh, Tea Lady and Kodumadal, Karur also. So it clearly shows that there is an interaction between the North and the South. These Panchmar, some of the Panchmar coins are to 6th century BC. And besides that, we collected a northern black polished ware. Uh, Kailedi and Alakan Kulam, Kurtkai and uh, Kodumanal and partly uh, and Karur also. We collected northern black polished ware that came from Gangetic region. And uh, if you take the rouleted ware, initially thought that rouleted ware is imported ware from the Roman world. But uh, now our uh, evidences clearly show that the rouleted ware dates goes back to even before 3rd century BC. That means before the Roman Empire. So where then we suspected that it would not be a, a Roman ware. Then the, the analysis clearly shows that uh, like a Professor Gokte from Deccan College and other people like uh, Hendrik uh, from uh, German all now clearly indicates that this is a Indian ware. Uh, and there are two hypotheses are there. It has came from Gangetic, and some people say it is locally made. But however, if you take it, all the available rouleted ware, put it on the map, and you see that all is concentrated along the east coast, not at the west coast. And it, these rouleted ware also available in, uh, in plenty in Southeast Asian countries, like particularly Thailand, Malaysia, and Indonesia, and uh, Vietnam. Uh, these places, these rouleted wares are available, and in south, in uh, uh, in the interior part, we are getting very less number of uh, rouleted ware. And uh, if you take uh, inscriptions, uh, and we are having a trader, the plowshare trader, donated uh, something uh, for a Jain bed, and uh, we are having Polu Vanihan, uh, Elan Chathan, the fellow who came from uh, Sri Lanka. He is a trader of Sri Lanka. Elan Chathan is written. His nature of work is a uh, plowshare trader. And you are having Karur Punvanihan. That means a gold trader from Karur, the capital city of Charas. And uh, there we are having a, another trader, a trade guild. They have served, they have, there is association. All the traders are coming to the, together and they created an association that is called Nikama. The Nikama is a trade guild uh, that, uh, that belongs to Vellarai. That is uh, where uh, close to Madurai region. And uh, we Eila Kudubihan, that means the man who came from Sri Lanka and he donated uh, some Jain beds. So the Enna Vanihan, that means oil trader. So in the Pogolo inscription of Tamil Brahmi inscription near uh, Karur, we are having a uh, oil trader. So 
these all uh, trolls are in a prosperous that's why you could they could able to donate lot of uh, wealth to the jain uh, monks and uh, besides we uh, collected lot in a uh, roman gold coins uh, of the among the gold coins that have been collected in the entire india nearly 90% of the coins uh, falls in kerala and tamil nadu and uh, if you take all the gold coins uh, hoards that are uh, unearth uh, in this uh, region all are located on the trade route nothing is away from the trade route all the coin hoards roman coin hoards are available on the trade route it shows that there is a, a greater relation between the roman coin hoard and also the uh, highways the nikama that is we found in the uh, inscription also found the inscribed part show uh, telling that there is a, there was a trade guild and uh, you are having a, a inscribed part shirt the one of the inscribed part shirt says that sapa magadai pammadan that means the ma- the sabha that means an association probably uh, it is located in magatha country so that man who came from uh, the name man came from magatha country his name is called pammada it is not a tamil name it is a prakrit name that has been tamilized prakrit actually and we are having lot of number of tisan like a tisa is a very famous in sri lanka so some of the tisan which we collected from our excavation probably the man who comes from having lot of inscribed inscription also having mentioning the sri lankan trader and in our literature says the food products came from sri lanka that means ilattu unavu is mentioned in the literature of pattinapalle so since that geographically very close to tamil nadu there is a lot of interaction uh, between sri lanka and tamil nadu and also kerala if you take into the trade route uh, all the trade routes and uh, capital cities uh, just uh, cap- and trade routes and capital cities if you see that one uh, there are it is all located along the passes and all the capital cities are having one port town like a karur or vanji of the capital of charas they having a port town like a musri and madurai the capital of pandya is having a port town like alaganpulam and kotkai and urayur uh, the capital city of chola is having a port town called kumbuhar and like that even veeri veliyan venman is another chieftain is located near arikamedu near pandicherry so all these are under the control of the state so the state is play, played a greater role in controlling the internal and external trade and if you take into the trade route that is passing through from west coast to east coast like a musri uh, it is passes through palkad this karu from there it goes to chola chola capital and reaches to the east coast of kumbhar so if you take into the all the trade route which is well connected the west coast and east coast is well connected the same way madurai all the capital cities port towns are well connected with the highways of that time so uh, these all uh, on this uh, highway we collected some of the milestone uh, this is milestone is called adiyaman peruvali that means the highway of the king adiyaman who is mentioned in the asogan edicts also the asogan edict is mentioning the four dynasty cities one is chara chola pandya and satyapudu sadiyapudu is nothing but adiyama uh, so that uh, milestone uh, is having the name of the place is mentioned market center is mentioned and also name, the distance is mentioned here it is mentioned of 27 here the bigger hole is 10 and uh, two bigger holes plus 10 plus plus 20 the small holes stands for 7 there are seven small holes so the total number of dist- the total distance between this place and to the market town is 27 kadam that means kadam is a unit like a kilometer so this is another new one milestone is near shalam so even the man illiterate fellow can understand by seeing the depression how much distance he is supposed to travel to reach the destination so this cleverly they used the milestone during the time of uh, uh, medieval times and the marine archaeology the coast is also nowadays by the national institute of oceanography national institute of ocean technology now indian maritime university all archaeological survey of india all are working in like mahavalipuram the people have done the work and also arikamedu the exploration carried out 
on Pumbuhar. They have done. Now we are planning to go for uh, underwater archaeological uh, exploration near Kurkai. So the government uh, is insisting to go for exploration. So the uh, in this uh, marine archaeology or the coastal uh, geomorphology, you can able to understand monsoon pattern. You can understand river migration. You can understand estuaries, the movement, and uh, and also sea level fluctuation, coastal erosion. Uh, so many uh, data will be coming up from out of marine archaeological studies. For instance, these are the and at the 65 uh, feet water depth, we collected some of the uh, circular objects. Uh, structures in Pumbugar. And uh, even the, our coastal survey, our of course, land survey, it shows that this temple is built during the time of uh, Pandya king. And it was actually there is an inscription on this temple. It clearly shows that during the 13th century or 14th century, the, it is not impossible to build a temple in the intertidal zone. So it's a sea, he has been, uh, his uh, regression has taken place. And uh, transgression also, some places are taking place. The front uh, Mantapa and Mukha Mantapa and Andarala has already gone into the sea. Now, only the Shantam Shantorium, the Garbagraha is left out. Behind that, you are having Maratha uh, king has constructed some of the temples. So, it also clearly shows that same. This Vanagiri is another temple uh, where the complete Maha Mantapa and Gobra has gone inside the sea. Now, the what we have left at is only a uh, Andarala and, uh, and one small Cassantum Centaurium and the Pragara wall, that uh, enclosure wall also gone inside the sea. And if you take then my complete uh, observation for the more than uh, 10 years, it clearly shows that when I take a photograph, you can see that there was sea was there, this wall is there. After five years, I have again I have taken a photograph, the wall has gone. After another five years, I have taken that even the statue, Kannai statue, which is majestically standing at a pedestal, is already the statue has fallen down and pedestal also tilted. And now it has been reconstructed recently uh, by the government of Tamil Nadu. So, in front of our head, within uh, 24 years of our observation, clearly shows that the sea is moving towards the land. So, and if you take a Kaveri river, the river migration has taken place. You can see the completely U bend. Actually, it was in fact. It was flowing in the northerly direction in the, during the early historic period. But now the river mouth is almost two kilometers south of the ancient uh, uh, river mouth. <coughs> and uh, there is an uh, uh, Musiri Alexandria trade contract of the second century uh, C. Uh, it says that the, there was a trade contract between the Musiri trader and Alexandria trader. The Musiri is located on the west coast uh, at the mouth of the river Periyar. And Alexandria is located on the mouth of the river Nile in uh, Egypt and Mediterranean Sea. So there was a contract between that trader and this trader. According to this uh, 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 trade contract, the goods will be uh, loaded at uh, Musiri port in the ship called Hermopolan. From there, they will move. Uh, Parisian, they will move to Parisian Gulf. After that, they will go to Red Sea, a fort called Kwasar El Kalim or Berenike. And there they will unload it. And again, they will put it on the donkey's back. And they carry, they cross the desert and they reach the Rael River at the place called Ancient Kopatas. And there they will again load it on the river boat. And the river boat will carry up to the Alexandria at the mouth of the river Nile. So there they will uh, unload the things and they will pay the ta tax, so whatever the custom tax they will pay, custom duties they will pay. And after that, the contract comes to an end. From there, it will go to the Rome. So this is one of the biggest uh, or one of the important evidence that we, we collected uh, from the Egypt. Uh, it is in the papyrus manuscript. And according to that one, and uh, this is the route which they are uh, moving. And uh, from Musri to Sokot Island. After Sokot Island, they will go to, to the uh, uh, Ethrain Sea and also reach Bernike. Then they cross the desert, go to ancient capitals, Nile Bank. Uh, through Nile uh, River, they will reach Alexandria. So this is the route. The entire uh, scenario is given in this uh, document. So the, in, in, uh, interestingly, 7.5 kilo Malabar black pepper have been collected at the Bernike. In the excavation and it kept below the floor level. It shows of this uh, uh, pepper. They consider it as a black gold. 
So, Ponnodu was the Kariyodu Peyram. That was they, they came with the gold and left with the pepper is mentioned in the literature. Accordingly, it was uh, brought a lot of gold to the uh, Kerala coast. And also, some of the inscriptions are also available, uh, like a Kannan, Satan, Potra Puman, Panayori, all we have found at Kosaril Kadim and also in uh, Berenike. And in recent Alakan Kulam excavation, and we got Tetro Jar kept in a line and close to the cell bangle uh, industry have been kept here and cell bangle industry we have kept uh, done a lot of uh, uh, Roman artifacts are Egypt from Egypt uh, the uh, figurine is shown that is of not local it came from foreign countries and also uh, ship motif engraved and a partial that also found we got a Roman uh, uh, kinds like Augustus and Caesar and also several uh, Roman artifacts we collected from Malagan Kulam and other places. It clearly shows that there was a greater trade contact between the West and the East. And uh, TGP ware, the turquoise blazed pottery also collected from Patanam, uh, from Kerala. And also uh, Asian Sarpdoja. Initially, we thought that because of the colonial archaeology, we always thought that uh, Roman, after Roman, State formation has taken place. Uh, we have minted coins, but uh, our recent evidences and uh, AMS data clearly shows that 300 years before the Roman entered into our Indian trade, and we are having a trade with the West. Even Arab and civilization also, we are having a trade. So the trade, uh, the legacy would have been continued even through through the years. So the contact between the Arabian Peninsula and the Indian West Coast is always there without. Uh, any break, it seems. And uh, there are uh, ins inscription is written that is collected from Khosr al Kadim in Egypt. And uh, here the name of the person is uh, written as Panayori. And also in Oman, at a place called Korori, uh, we collected an inscribed parcel written as Nandai Kiran. So this is the place where the frankincense are going, and this is a frankincense tree. And from the gum, they extract and they import it uh, to the West Coast, what they call it Kunglium in uh, uh, South Indian language. So this is one of the species, they be aromatic uh, resin that has been imported from Oman and also wine has been imported. And if you take entire uh, scenario from the 6th century BC to uh, 3rd century AD, almost up to 1000 years. Uh, if you see the all the ancient ports that is uh, connected uh, with uh, South India, and the concentration is more uh, in Kerala and Tamil Nadu and also partly in Sri Lanka. And uh, if you take towards east, you can see the uh, just opposite to the what we call uh, 10 degree channel. And uh, there you get in Thailand, the concentration is more. And after that, you are having in Vietnam. At in Okio culture, we are having. And the entire coast from Tamralipti uh, to uh, like Sisvalkar, Manika Patana, Palu, Ramravati, and uh, Kota Patana in Andhra Pradesh and the west coast also. Plenty of sites of very historic sites. We have been uh, explored like Barigaz and Chopara, all are very important uh, ports on the west coast and also Patanam recently excavated sites. It clearly shows that uh, the almost more than uh, 600 years, these all ports are very active and it's having a, a greater interaction with the West and the East. And Sri Lanka also, all the very interestingly, the entire uh, Sri Lankan South Coast, like a Ridhyagama, like a Tisha Maharama, all these places, we are having a plenty of evidences that has been uh, uh, contact with uh, as well as India and also with the uh, Southeast Asia. So it seems that uh, Indian traders are uh, always moved to Sri Lanka. From there also, they move towards uh, Southeast Asia and also towards the West. Uh, so uh, in uh, if you see the shipwreck that identified at Godavaya in Sri Lanka, this was the, one of the earliest shipwrecks so far discovered in Indian subcontinent. So we are getting a plenty of material that black and red we are getting uh, and also uh, uh, glass ingots also we collected and uh, the, uh, the evidence are coming up. It seems that either it has been uh, exported from uh, Sri Lanka or the material has moved from our Indian ship it has moved through the Sri Lankan port like uh, Tisha Maharama or Gama. These, these are the areas in the southern side part of Sri Lanka. 
So in the uh, Thailand also, we are having the greater interaction with the West Coast, what we call uh, the well, Thakkola and all the later uh, medieval sites also located and the ancient early historic sites also located and all just opposite in Gulf of Thailand, we are having an uh, important site. So the people uh, moved from uh, East Coast uh, to uh, Thailand coast and the Western part of Thailand coast, then moved to East Coast, from there they go to Vietnam. So Roman intaglios also we found uh, in the site some of the material uh, move uh, like a perum patankal that is uh, in a Brahmi script which is a touchstone uh, to test the uh, gold. So this is uh, found uh, in uh, in Thailand and uh, some of the material that also carnelian beads uh, of early historic period and all some of the height in bronzes that are all found and this uh, material it seems that it has been imported from india and it now it has been uh, placed inside a grave in vietnam so the trade uh, according to the tradition even today the exploration that has been conducted in thailand clear show they take this uh, sea route along the sea route they go to the east coast all the important archaeological sites are located on these uh, river banks so it seems that the people have moved from west to east and uh, the monsoon pattern also uh, helped a lot in uh, deciding the uh, movement of the ship uh, from west to east. They have taken advantage of the uh, monsoon pattern. So it also shows that there are a lot of uh, sites yet to be explored and yet to be excavated. And some of the sites is yet to be identified. For instance, uh, the Salavana, though we know that uh, Mamallapuram is one of the important uh, ports uh, during the Palawar times, but still, we could not able to identify, locate the place. But uh, after tsunami, it got exposed. And the excavation clearly shows that there was a small uh, hill, a rock uh, is exposed. In the rock, we got uh, inscription of uh, Pallavas, Cholas, and Rashtrakutas. All the three kingdoms inscription we found in this inscription. First time, the inscription uh, clearly says about the Mamallapuram. Uh, the inscription is mentioning about the site and uh, the exposure of that uh, in and around that uh, uh, rock. Uh, we found the huge temple that is a Kartiyaya temple. It was uh, the lower part is having brick structure and the superstructure is of stone. So the inscription also says that most of the temple of South India is converted from brick to stone. So Katrali Akini, the inscription is clearly telling that initially it was brick and now it has been converted into stone. So these type of evidences, uh, so a lot of our cultural heritage is hidden below the soil. A lot of exploration need to be carried out. Scientific analysis, we have to make, we have to make uh, excavation and we have to read inscriptions and we have to numismatic studies, epigraphic studies, literary studies, historical linguistic studies, all is required to understand the complete picture of uh, Indian uh, trade and uh, our technological advancement. So I do hope that this uh, 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 type of settlement pattern helped to emergence of state. So emergence of state is not a single day affair. It is due to various factors. This uh, territorial affiliation of Chara country or Chola country or Pandya country or, or small kingdoms all emerged due to the uh, longer exposure to the trade, uh, our internal activities, agricultural production, industrial production, and uh, integrity of the uh, territory. All has taken place, then only the state formation has taken place. It may be due to trade, it may be due to technology, or due to, due to agriculture production, it may be region by region, uh, it may change. So the micro region study is required to understand the complete picture of this early historic terminal. So for the past 30 years that work is going on, I think so we, are, we could be able to understand nearly 10% of the early historic period. And remaining 90% uh, we have yet to understand. Uh, so, uh, with this small presentation, uh, I do hope that we could be able to express and see that cultural wealth of India. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you uh, so much, uh, Professor Rajan. Some mind-boggling uh, 
a lecture, lot of evidences, and uh, it also reminds us how how much is buried uh, underneath. I mean, there's a lot of scope for uh, renewed surveying, exploration, and also limited and planned excavation, so that much more more can be uh, revealed. And uh, it's it's really uh, a kind of a hallmark evidence is what you have unearthed, the systematic uh, exploration, systematic excavations also, that's so uh, connecting between the west towards the east and also a lot of uh, connecting dots uh, from Sri Lanka, Thailand, Southeast Asia. It's really a remarkable achievement. And thank you uh, very much, Professor Rajan, for this wonderful uh, lecture. Uh, Sharda, are you there? Yes, I'm there. Uh, am yeah, I audible? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you are yeah, audible. audible. You are audible. Yeah, I request Hello, you to yeah, I request you to take over, and if we have questions, uh, uh, it will be. Um, I request uh, all the participants to kindly type their questions in the Q and A box, so we can have them all together in one place. Yeah, um, I, 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 of, yeah I, I don't see any question in the Q and A. Uh, question. Yeah. A lot of congratulatory messages for you, Professor Rajan, on an excellent lecture. So if you have any comments, or, uh, please type them in the Q&A box. I repeat my request for the participants. It seems everyone is overwhelmed by the evidence what he showed. <laughs> okay, I see one question now in the Q&A box. So I'll begin with that. Um, this is by uh, RN Kumaran, who asks, um, Sir, what about the black on red wear from Tandikudi? Uh, uh, in fact, uh, our Tandikudi expression has exposed uh, new evidence to us. Uh, we initially we thought that uh, everything starts with Iron Age in uh, South India because of this megalithic monuments actually misguided us uh, for a longer period of nearly 25 years. It has been misguided us. We believe that uh, the black and red were megalithic monuments uh, are like a cultural package. It always comes to whether it is independently black and red were has come or all the monuments come independently that we earlier we are not aware of. But in our continuous exploration, and, um, uh, almost uh, 3,000 archaeological sites have been exposed now and explored and also documented. It gives uh, now a picture better our understanding. Uh, in our excavation at Tandikudi, we got one uh, portrait without any iron, without any carnelian beads, without any iron age uh, content. Uh, we got block on red bear. Actually, in fact, uh, Professor Alchin uh, it has uh, suspected that it could be a pre iron age or Neolithic. And in our excavation, we got that pit burial. And in, uh, in the pit burial, we got three layers of parts, uh, uh, like hundreds of parts have been kept in three layers. In that, uh, in all the, all the burials, we are yielded carnelian, but this in not did you have any carnelian beads or iron pieces. We suspect that it may be a pre iron age. But at the time, we don't have the date of Mangadu or uh, Telanganur or Shivakalai. But today, we are having more than 10 dates that goes uh, close to uh, 2nd million BC. And some of the dates also goes to pre Iron Age. So we uh, considered that it may be a pre Iron Age um, uh, ma ma monument, uh, megalithic monument. But uh, whether to call it as a Neolithic, we don't have any evidence of Neolithic because uh, we are uh, that uh, it is uh, wheel made pottery and well uh, manufactured uh, objects are available. Agro pastoral economy, it looks like a trade. So it may be pre Iron Age, but uh, uh, what could be the date is yet to be analyzed. But based on our uh, other dates, uh, we can say that it is a, a pre Iron Age, maybe around uh, second millennium BC. So the next question is from T.S. Subramaniam. Uh, yeah. And he asks that from where did these industrial sites in Tamil Nadu get their copper 
uh, did they get it from Rajasthan, from the Khetri uh, belt or uh, from the Aharbanas uh, belt? Yeah, it is very, very tricky question, actually very important question also uh, for our future investigation. Actually, we are making analysis of uh, copper object like uh, Dr. Sharda Srinivasan has done it. And uh, our Ian Glover from Institute of Archaeology, uh, the London, and uh, he also has done uh, some of analysis uh, uh, in Thailand. Uh, but uh, the evidence uh, uh, is not very clear. Uh, to say that it has come from the Rajasthan or it has come from Thailand. Uh, but uh, as far as our uh, Adichanalur, Sivakalai or Kodumanal or any other site is concerned with availability of height in branch, the chemical or the analysis clearly shows that there is a uniformity. But we don't have any copper ore. But uh, in Kodumanal only we got uh, copper industry, but whether the copper ingots have been imported and converted into uh, copper object, that we don't know. Uh, but we are also getting a copper, uh, uh, copper hoard uh, from Ramanathapuram and also near Pollachi. And when if we, we feel that there's no copper hoard in uh, Thailand, so the copper hoard concept uh, is available only in the north. So that would have that when the copper ore could come to Tamil Nadu, then naturally the copper object also can come to Tamil Nadu. So there is a both way. Now the thing is kept open. We can't say categorically that it has come from Rajasthan or it only come from Thailand. Both is quite possible. With the height in branch of Sivagalai and Alchanulur, it looks like it's from Thailand. But the same way, but Apukul uh, near Villu and also from uh, Pollachi and Ramanavaram, that comes from North. So both the way they, they would have uh, possibilities are there. As on today, evidence says that it may be from either from Rajasthan or Thailand, but only future discoveries and analysis alone can clear this mist. Okay, thank you. Uh, Prabhu, uh, the next question is from Denny Yadav who asks, uh, is there any evidence that there existed some kind of direct trade between India and China? Uh, only Han Dynasty, we collected the Indo-Pacific beads. And uh, the Indo-Pacific beads, that uh, chemical analysis uh, shows that it's from South. And, uh, uh, but uh, whether it is a direct contact, uh, there is a very little evidence we are having because whatever the Prakrit Brahmi or Tamil Brahmi inscription that are available, uh, only mostly available in uh, Thailand and also little available in Vietnam. Beyond Vietnam, we are not getting uh, this, in, uh, this type of uh, linguistic uh, link. Uh, so there may be material alone can go. Uh, is, uh, our material alone can go up to Thai, Vietnam and uh, China. Even the people need not to migrate. Even if they are going to China also, then it takes a lot of time to come back to their native place. Or uh, I don't know whether because uh, Asan today, it seems that they exchanged the material at Thailand or at uh, Vietnam. Uh, our material is exchanged with the Chinese uh, traders, it seems, Asan today. Because we are getting little evidence in China except that uh, grave, glass beads, we are not getting any other evidence. But in case of Vietnam, uh, Malaysia, Thailand, and Indonesia, we are getting a lot of evidence. Even Buddhism. Okay, uh, Professor Arjun? Yes. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. <clears throat> I think we lost you for a few seconds. Okay. Um, okay, so the can I move on to the next question? Yes, yes, please. Yeah, okay. So um, the next one is uh, by Veera Raghavan who asks, uh, has any scientific analysis been done on the beads which have been recovered from Kiladi? Yeah, uh, now uh, we have uh, conducted uh, two analysis we have already made. And uh, there's no much difference between uh, 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 beads that we collected from Porundal or uh, uh, other places like Manikolai or Arikamed and all that all potassium based aluminum, the three, AL3 only. Uh, so the work is going on. Uh, but uh, we, now, we, again, we have uh, we have been planning to give the material to Alok and also he may come up with uh, more evidences. But uh, analysis is going on, not full uh, report has come up, only we have limited data is available. But uh, the limited data shows that uh, there is locally manufactured, uh, distributed from locally. 
locally in the sense within the micro mm. region in trade micro trade like a karnataka andhra pradesh and tamil nadu kerala <clears throat> okay so um the next question is she asks um shirts with uh basket impressions are located on the mud flats uh, of the um coast of eastern bengal uh-huh. supposed to be similar from uh, those from java or sumatra so she is yeah. really interested to to hear about your insights on basket impression red wear found near uh-huh. coastal eastern part of india yeah. Yeah, yeah, of course, uh, this is one of the biggest evidence to say that uh, there is a link between Southeast Asia and uh, we got plenty of evidences in uh, that uh, Bengal and uh, Orisha border where Srila Tilpati also has done uh, good work on it. And uh, K.P. Rao has discovered a lot of uh, stamped parties and this basket impulse from Patapatana. And uh, it is uh, partly is, uh, that ex- in the excavation at Arikamedu, and uh, the, in the exploration uh, one ramesh uh, collected some of the parts from southeast asia but uh, uh, neither uh, whatever wheeler or kasal has not reported that type of pottery so probably at the time they would have not identified uh, understand this uh, uh, basket uh, impressed pottery or stamped pottery what they call it but in our galagonkalam excavation also they collected one or two pieces but the the majority of the excavation that has been conducted on the coastal side of uh, uh, india the problem is that most of the scholars are not uh, knowing that uh, southeast asian pottery because they are not having uh, acquaintance with that they are knowing that silidan ware chinese ware and all this porcelain ware but they have not much concentrated on uh, our uh, pottery uh, of southeast asia like uh, till uh, patnam excavation the trapodo jar and uh, uh, tra- uh, that uh, tgp bear are not uh, though they have reported uh, from even alagankulam trapodo jar has been reported but uh, before uh, the patnam excavation none of the site of india they used to call uh, this tgp at trapodo jar so because their identification problem was there about 20 years back now the recent evidence is our interaction with the fellow scholars of uh, west and east clearly exposed to this pottery blocks to southeast asia or arabian peninsula that way kottapattana uh, is one of the biggest evidence and periyapattinam uh, also we collected a lot of chinese pottery along with the one or two pieces of this pottery at that time even i was in the excavation but i could not able to identify that at that time but now we realize that this is the pottery of southeast asia so this is identification problem because of lack of uh, knowledge of south asian south asian pottery ceramics okay um this another question by ta subramanyam has peer review been done on the telanganur iron object states yes yes because we have published in the journal of archaeological science that is peer reviewed okay. journal yeah mm-hmm. by uh, okay. but uh, it has come in the uh, 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 park js park the name of first author is js park so only okay. i am second author and the other one is ramesh okay so um, there are some very general questions which may require a longer answer but uh, it would help if you can be a bit brief about them um for instance this one which asks which were the early trading communities in south india this question is by dr javed ahmed from kashmir yeah the uh, but fixing a community uh, for uh, the available is only epigraphical as well as uh, mm. literary both goes uh, hand in hand uh, for instance satan satan is a trader like a satavakana what we call it satan is a trader so all the names that uh, having a suffix satan uh, kandan satan uh, like that these are all uh, trading community but what type of trade they have carried is a big question for instance kiran what we got uh, kiran is a suffix uh, like uh, what we call nakiran ilangiran he is a artisan family uh, uh, for literature clearly says that uh, nakira comes from the kanch cell industry but where the same anadan kiran uh, from porundal he comes from uh, glass bead making so like a what we call shreshti maybe a name is shreshti or shetty uh, maybe a trader but he, they may be doing different type of trade i think same family maybe in one of the family 
father is one one type of trader another is another type of trader so we can't uh, uh, say pin point that but uh, like a kula vanigan that means a textile trader and pun vanigan is a gold trader uh, like a plowshare kulu vanigan is a plowshare trader so the trading community we can identify but the by name by suffix it's very difficult to fix which trade which trade they made but uh, in in generally you can call it all satan uh, is a traders okay uh, bashir ahmed has a question that was there any trade directly made from north india to rome through the south indian region Uh, but the literature says that i have imported uh, from ganges gangai wari gangai wari means hmm. object that has been imported from uh, ganges up to uh, patanam in kerala because hmm. that musri uh, trade uh, that uh, contract the memo that uh, trade contract yes. given a complete list of object that has been exported from musri to rome in that list ganges material is also available so if the ganges material is exported from musri means that ganges material has been imported from ganges to um, uh, kerala from kerala it has been exported but already we are having punch mark coins already we are having northern black polish ware already we are having prakrit words already we are having several names of so prakrit arjun from north indian arjun that is very like a vishaki vishaka all are north indian traders and we are having a sabha magadai pammada that man comes from magadha country and uh, our literature says that uh, blacksmith came from avanti uh, avanti tacharam magadha kollarum blacksmith came from magadha and uh, carpenter came from avanti this all mentioned in the literature so there is a greater con- contact between the north and south even before 1000 bc only that literary evidences we are getting from 6th century bc onwards are the uh, this uh, epigraphic evidences but otherwise the north house contact is uh, from the time of uh, neolithic or even harappan times we are feeling that uh, moved from uh, kolar region to indus valley so the harappan uh, the c- c- copper hoards are sort of available in south also so it also was that before uh, 2000 bc before iron age also there is a greater contact even megargar we are getting a uh, and the shell and conches that goes from uh, uh, gulf of campe or the makran coast it has already reached so some of the objects which we are getting maybe not direct uh, from hand to hand it has been moved but there is a references of north is mentioned in literature even in sri lankan literature clearly shows that they are aware of the even geographical name of the region also community because asoga king asoga is mentioning the dynasty itself Okay, so the next question is from Gozali Chatterjee. Uh, she asks, "Is there any site where we have the evidence of steel manufacturing, some kind of a furnace, for instance, has been found?" Yeah, steel manufacturing is available in Karnataka, Andhra Pradesh, and Tamil Nadu already exposed. Jay Krishna has hmm. written a lot of articles, and Sharda Singh has also written it. Uh, and uh, in our excavation, I exposed a crucible furnace. Uh, where we may have manufactured steel so we are, and also telangana that uh, sword itself is steel maybe you are that uh, only the dating having a, a little doubt about uh, that uh, plus or minus 200 bc is there but otherwise mm-hmm. it was a steel sword goes back to 1500 bc safe safer date but mm-hmm. iron goes to 2000 bc uh, even gan even in mid ganga valley as well as our in the south india also. the recent ams dates are giving goes back to that date so, so uh, was, yeah sorry sorry sir i cut you short sorry no it's all right please please carry on okay so uh, we just have one or two questions more um the next one is from sora vilai who asks uh, who first uh, who first of course thanks you for the talk and then um, he has two questions Uh, the first one is what are the reasons that the ancient people insisted for overseas trade uh, can you repeat um, this what are what the... are the reasons uh. that the ancient people they insisted on going for overseas trading uh, no see they are uh, with this uh, going for maritime trade or perhaps oceanic trade brings lot of wealth to them 
and mm. uh, the south india particularly peninsular india is exposed on the both the side if all, all the three sides you are having a ocean from mm. the day one uh, they are collecting a conch and also pearl industry is very flourishing and sri lanka is very close when the sea level goes movement is become very easy for them even the literature uh, sri lankan inscriptions clearly says that people came from uh, south and uh, even buddhism went even before the now recent evidence shows that there is a jainism also went to sri lanka jainism did not flourish there but buddhism already is there and prakrit language is already there even our dharmagala farmer and agricultural agricultural survey of sri lanka already proved that microlithic pools should have come from uh, south so this movement is moved from first govam of us near us to sri lanka and from sri lanka to uh, south east asia they might have moved from uh, tamra lipti and all along the coast up to thailand but uh, from going from uh, orisha uh, kalinga patana or from further south of andhra pradesh or or tamil nadu coast is uh, they have strands oceanic so uh, according to some scholars there was a 10 degree channel the channel the water flow <coughs> moves from sri lanka towards south east asia so if you leave the boat in the 10 degree channel automatically it will carry the boat with a lesser effect uh, to plankton that's it because the ins- inscription says ma nakavara that means nicobar island is mentioned in, uh, in the inscription that means between andaman uh, the movement has taken place it directly it reaches to plankton or uh, thailand so it is uh, first they came to uh, andaman nicobar island from there to here that we don't have we don't have any much evidence because less exploration carried out in manakavara in nicobar island but however we are getting a both uh, material from uh, south as well as from north like a prakrit inscription seals and carnelian beads and pearl all that we are getting from here to there and from there we are getting copper camphor and uh, another medicinal plants all we are getting even min- uh, literature is telling that it came from there so what makes them to go to east or what makes them go to west is uh, probably our uh, economic is the criteria bringing a lot of wealth to that because uh, major 90% of the gold coins that are available in india is found only in south that shows the lot of trade activities from roman world as well as with india okay. um so the same participant has another question Uh, were there any kind of uh, middle places for exchanging goods like the harappan civilization uh, it is very difficult to say at this moment say. because mm-hmm. 1500 bc around uh, uh, the middle of uh, second millennium bc the harappan civilization came to an end mm-hmm. <clears throat> only the linkage what what we are having is a linguistic linkage either ayra asko parpolo or ayra damaka devan or any other scholar uh, working on it is only giving a historical linguistic linkage between harappan and south like a tamil or any other dravidian language whatever it is called now beyond that people are asking the material evidence that has come from the uh, harappan indus valley to south india that we are not getting beyond daimabad what we are not getting any harappan material directly either harappan seal or any other harappan material but uh, probably that by 1500 bc the harappan civilization is started disintegrated uh, by the time uh, here it is emerging before the 2002 bc 2500 bc there is a less evidence in south india so i uh, but <clears throat> language can survive but cultural material evidences can can may not be survived because what uh, my grandfather grandfather using uh, the material same i am not using but uh, i am using the same language for the past 2500 years so the language can survive for a longer period of time but the material uh, the same material for longer period of time as far as our archaeological evidence is concerned what we are uh, dividing the cultural phases is also based on the material evidence only so the material evidence will not survive because due to the technological development uh, interaction between the different communities movement of the goods and all everything will change the material life of the people uh, but cultural life sometimes may not change much so that difference we have to closely observe then we have to take a decision 
whether uh, the cultural linkage between there and uh, here is there, but without uh, any material linkage. That too will, time only will say. At Assam today, it is only the language part. They have, it is dominant, dominating the scene. Maybe in future, I don't know. Okay. Um... So I think we have covered most of the questions unless Professor Prabhakar has... Yeah, uh, there are one or two questions which I will take. Uh, Ambali asks, uh, which Sangam age works mention about the trade centers of Tamil Ragam? Uh, this, uh, see, first the term Sangam is not, av not available the entire Sangam literature. That we have to realize first. The Sangam term use of Sangam term is found only in 8th century or in Agapurul only. So that is a late. But what is the term time is different. That is, there is a people are telling mandram and we are telling several terms who have been used to denote that the poets were together. There is a tradition is telling that there are three Sangam. And one is all the, the one is the, gone inside the sea. Uh, what they, but that is also not mentioned in the Sangam literature. That is mentioned in the post Sangam literature of Mani Magalai, Mani Magalai only. So these uh, confusions are there. But uh, one thing is very clear uh, the movement is from north to south, is not there. The movement is always from south to north, from Kanyakumari to Vyar. But uh, when our archaeological excavation that we have conducted in the uh, entire Tamil Nadu, when you go towards south, uh, either Sivakalai or Adi Chanalur or any other side, normally we are getting early date. When we go to north, we are not uh, getting. But the, why we are not getting? Because it is not isolated. It is a micro region. There would be a lot of uh, interaction. But our excavation in the south is very limited. Except Kotkai, none of the habitation site is excavated. Only the burial grave site like Adi Chanalur is excavated and Sivakala is excavated. Bigger excavation has not been carried out. So it may, so to get a clear picture about these uh, Sangam uh, factors, that will be required uh, more excavations. Uh, that's why we are planning to go more excavation in the south uh, rather than in the north. Because, uh, because of Madras University and Tamil University, Pondicherry University, uh, State Archaeology, in a, what we, I call it as a catchment area. Uh, the fund available, make them to go only for within the catchment area. So that expression is carried out. But in the Madurai or in uh, uh, Tirunal Valley University, Manar Maniam Sundaran University, no, there's no archaeological department. So they have not excavated that area much. I think, I hope so. In future, uh, more evidence comes, the picture will be cleared. But till the time, we have to wait. Yeah, uh, we'll take one more question, one last question. Irfan Muhammad, he asks about one composite ornament from Kodumanal, which consists of gold, silver, and pearl object. And overall, it seemed to be a nose ring or an ear ring. He asks whether uh, this unusual, unusual ornament can be a result of overseas trade or inland trade. No, I have not come across pearl. Uh, and he's, uh, he's talking something about a composite ornament consisting of gold, silver, and pearl. No, no, gold and silver I got. I have shown that picture also. Yeah, but it's, a, it's a tiger. Gold I didn't get. It is organic material. It may not survive in that environment because uh, pearl is an organic material. But it would have been inlaid. Inlaid with the carnelian beads was there. A gold, carnelian, silver was there, not pearl. Uh, maybe okay. he maybe misunderstood that one, but uh, we I have not come across our Arthur of India or Tamil Nadu state or country has not come across any poll so far. Only the poll which we have suspected from TLD that also whether it is a glass or poll, we are testing it. Then only we will declare whether it's a poll or a glass because both are uh, misleading. That's why we are given for analysis. Okay, uh... none of the site in none of the site in Tamil Nadu so far we have not come across any poll. Okay. One looks like a pearl, but with a gold, they could have shown that we are uh, analyzing. Then we will declare it whether it's a pearl or uh, glass. Thank you, uh, thank you, Professor Rajan. Uh, uh, but uh, one more information I used to say that yeah, yeah, in Bernike, yeah, in Egypt, in Egypt we got gold with a gold. Okay, okay. Uh, so maybe that one they, I think uh, they are asking. 
Okay, okay. So uh, we have uh, covered most of the questions and uh, uh, I, I thank uh, Professor Rajan for his very pa patient hearing and also answering most of the questions. Uh, it was really an eye opener for me uh, and I hope uh, all the participants also enjoyed the talk. And I really thank uh, you, sir, for uh, sparing your valuable time for delivering this wonderful talk. And we uh, look forward for much, much more interactions with you. And if possible, uh, more uh, scientific analysis can be carried out on your material so that uh, much more important aspects can be brought out. Thank you very much. And I also thank all the participants uh, uh, to, to attend uh, this uh, lecture, even though there was initial hiccups. Uh, and I hope to see all of you again uh, in the last Saturday of next month. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Much.